Hi, this is Jamie with Stonemeyer Games, and today in this week's Sunday Sit Down, I'm going to talk about mini games. Um, and by mini games, I think there are a couple different definitions I could be using. I'm specifically talking about games within other games. Mostly, I'll talk about tabletop games today. I'll talk a little bit about video games because there are a ton of mini games and video games. Um, but I just want to clarify that that I'm not talking about a small board game. I'm talking about a small uh, mini game. Sometimes it's a puzzle. Uh, inside of a greater board game or a bigger board game. Um, and I'll give you an example for this so it's clear from right from the start. Let's pick one. There are a few that are kind of minor spoilers, and I'll be clear, I'll be clear to, uh, to highlight them. But an example of one, uh, here I'll start with A Feast for Odin. A Feast for Odin has um, some mini games in it. That could also be qualified or classified as a skill test per last week's video, but I think uh, they're also considered, I think in the game they're actually called mini games. So in A Feast for Odin, if you want to go hunting or pillaging, you uh, you put a worker down, and instead of many of the other worker placement spots, instead of just putting a worker down and getting something, you put a worker down and then you have to do something else. You have to play a little game. And that game involves um, usually rolling a die, um, depending on the action space, it's usually a D8 or a D12. You roll that die, and then you decide how many uh, swords or weapons, whatever the, the, the item required by the action is, you commit those items to that action and either succeed or fail. And if you succeed, you get, like a, you get some certain tokens, some tiles. Um, if you fail, usually you get maybe one of the workers back and you get a, a compensation for failing. So either way, you're getting a little bit of something, but there's a, a pass or fail mechanism to it. Um, and then the next player takes their turn. So it's it's kind of a break from the action of the, of the normal flow of the game to do something specific and hopefully thematic. And so today I'm going to talk about some examples of this. I've been thinking about it a, late, a lot lately because I've been working on some mini games for a, uh, a game that I'm designing. And so it's been on my mind a lot lately. So I'll talk about some examples and I'll talk about some things that I've learned by looking at these examples and by designing some mini games of my own as to the types of mini games that I really enjoy that I like to see in games, opposed to those that, that aren't as interesting to me. Um, so yeah, let's. Uh, I'll I'll go through and give some examples here. So, a feast for Odin is one example of a competitive game that uses these mini games. Um, I would say the the list skews a little bit towards cooperative because in cooperative games, a break from the action is a little bit easier because all the players are still engaged in that mini game, or ideally, they're all engaged. Uh, but there are some competitive examples. A feast for Odin is one of them. Another competitive example is uh, The Rise of Queensdale. This is a legacy village building game. It was one of my favorite games that I played last year. And uh, this is the first minor spoiler that I'm going to give here. It's, it's very, very small. But, uh, but if you want to play The Rise of Queensdale, don't listen for the next 30 seconds. Basically, one of the things that you can unlock in this game is a shell game. Um, kind of the classic almost like street game that people can play where you have uh, three shells and you have um, a little a little token under one of those shells and you move those shells around and you reveal one of those one of the shells uh, or people say okay I think that's the, the the cup or the shell that has something under it and so rise of queen still has that little mini game and it does provide I mean it is a break from the action in the game but I really like how involved all the players are in it. So whenever the shell game happened in our game, we were all very excited to play. And not even everyone was excited to play, but the people who weren't playing were excited to watch. So I like that it mix, mixed this element in a competitive game of involving other players. And if you're not playing, it's a spectacle. It's a spectacle sport to watch. It's entertaining for those who are not participating in it. So I thought that was really cool. And spoilers, you can come back now if, if uh, I need to put like a sign up on the screen that shows spoilers for that kind of thing. But that was a really minor spoiler. Uh, a very well-known game that I think is almost classified as a game that uh, accumulates several different mini games in it is Trajan or Trahan, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I'll pronounce it Trajan. I don't own Trajan. Uh, I'll, I'll mention it in the comments below or in the description below. But in Trajan, you, uh, the core aspect of the game, and this, this is a little different than some of the other mini games I'm describing. Some people would say that Moncala that you have, the action selection system, is a mini game. I would agree for some definitions that uh, you're, 
it, it is a little bit of a mini game of, of itself, the Moncala action selection. But when I'm talking about mini games, specifically under my definition today, in Trajan, I'm referring to the different mini games on the board. So uh, the, there, there are, I think, five or six different sections of the board. You're choosing one of them to interact with on your turn. And uh, the action in that section is completely different than an action or one of the other mini games on the board. So it's like Stefan Feld designed six different mini games and put them together on the same board and let you play those different mini games as much as you want, which I think is kind of cool that, uh, that you can design these very unique mini games and give players a reason that they might focus on all of them or just specialize in one of them and be really good at that. And what, this is one of the things I love about mini games in a, in a game like this, in, in a competitive game like Trajan. If you're having fun with a particular mini game, you can just do it a lot. You can repeat it over and over again. Uh, you can get better at it both in terms of your skill, like as a, as a human being, as a game player, and also in terms of gameplay mechanisms. There might be ways that you can upgrade your abilities so that you get better at one mini game over another mini game. Uh, so I like that, that you have this, this choice, this array of little games that you can you either enjoy playing or you don't enjoy playing, and you can choose the ones that you like. Another example of that uh, that I've only played once is Gugong. Um, I, I haven't played it many times, but it, I, as I was playing it, I, I remember thinking this this is very similar to Trajan. That there are lots of little, little different mini games around the board, um, and not only was it fun to play them in terms of I could pick the mini games that I enjoyed, but I also liked that uh, when I'm learning a game like Gugong, I can just pick a mini game and play it a few times until I understand it, and then move on to another one. So I can kind of focus on one until I learn the rules for it, and then and then play something else. So it, it made the game actually more accessible, even though uh, you might think with a game with a lot of mini games that, it's actually, that it might be a little intimidating to learn all of these different games up front, which might be the preference of some players. But for me, the way I learn games, I like to just try something a few times, learn from it, and then try something else. But I think that is a consideration to keep in mind, that if you are throwing a competitive game at players with multiple, maybe five or six different mini games, that can be a barrier to entry because you're forcing them to learn six different games instead of one core mechanism. Uh, there are also some team-based games that use mini games. Uh, one is Space Cadets Dice Duel that I haven't played, so I won't talk much about that. But if you want to look up Space Cadets, you can see it's, it is a game that uh, both the Dice Duel version and the core game of Space Cadets, uh, they give each player an asymmetric minigame to play, which I think is really interesting. And I'll carry that over into Captain Sonar. Captain Sonar is a game that I have played a number of times, and it's a team game where you are on... Uh, competing submarines, and each player on the submarine has a very unique role to play and a very unique mini game to play. Um, one of the mini games is like the engineering mini game is you're trying to, uh, as you use different actions, you like cross them off and you're trying to keep certain parts of the submarine running. Um, it's kind of a, a route connection mini game. There's also the player who's trying to figure out where the other team's submarine is. There's the captain who's determining where your submarine is going. And then there is the, I think there's like the weapons expert or something like that, the technology expert. They're determining um, which, uh, which abilities of the su submarine you're powering up so that you can use them to, uh, to, to your advantage as a team. Uh, but I really like this idea of a team game with a lot of unique mini games that you get to try out. It leads to a lot of replayability. It leads to a lot of ownership over your role uh, because you're the only one doing this game. And because Captain Sonar is usually played in real time, uh, you don't have other players interfering with you. You are focusing on this one specific thing. You're in charge of it. There's no one quarterbacking you or, t or alpha gaming you and telling you what to do. You get to have full control over that. Um, and so this is a great example that I really enjoy, and this will appear in one of my other games of uh, asymmetric mini games that uh, that only you have. So you have an asymmetric element of the game that is a mini game in itself, and only you are are participating in that mini game. All the other players are doing different mini games. This was actually the original concept behind Tuscany. Uh, I don't, I can't remember the game that inspired it actually. Now that, now that I'm thinking about it, um, and Tuscany didn't end up being this. Tuscany is an expansion of Viticulture, a game that I designed. And uh, originally, the idea is that every player would have a very different asymmetric role in the, the Tuscan foothills related to wine, but not necessarily, um, not always actually directly connected to wine. Uh, the different, just different roles that you play in the village. And each player would have a very different asymmetric minigame. I couldn't get it to work, so that's not what I ended up doing with Tuscany, but that was the original concept behind it. Um, 
Mansions of Madness is a is a game that has a, a number of different mini games in it. I'm aware of three of them. There might be more that I'm forgetting or that that are that appear in different expansions. But I'm talking about Mansions of Madness Second Edition, which uses an app to play these mini games, um, which I think is really clever because Mansions of Madness, what it does is that it remembers your progress, which you could do on the table. Um, for a couple of these. One is a circuit connection mini game. Um, another is a shape movement mini game where you're like sliding these shapes around to try to get a certain piece of that puzzle through a hole. So there's like one exit and you're trying to move these shapes around uh, to, to configure one to get through the hole. That on the table would be easy to remember. The one that I think would be difficult for uh, to remember if in, in cardboard form opposed to digital form is there's this icon puzzle where you are trying to basically like match up uh, or, or figure out which icons are the correct icons and in the correct order. Um, and uh, I think the app does that one really well, whereas on uh, the tabletop, it would be cumbersome to remember and cumbersome to even play this mini game at all. I'm not sure if it appeared in the original edition of Mansions of Madness. So that's where maybe a digital version or where the game itself is remembering past progress on a mini game that you maybe start to play on your turn. You don't finish, but you can return to it. I think that's kind of a cool mechanism to use in a mini game uh, that it's not an all or nothing proposition like in uh, Feast for Odin. Though I like in Feast for Odin how there, there is a, you gain something even if you don't win the mini game. Um, let's jump over to time stories this is one where again i need to hold up the the spoiler sign although I, I won't actually spoil anything but in time stories there are lots of different mini games that you encounter um, i just played the final um episode of or, or uh, scenario of the original story arc of time stories i played it uh, on saturday or friday night uh it was called madame i don't have it with me right now to show you but madame had three mini games that we found uh, they were all spatial mini games, and they were all really, really cool. Um, and but, but the the one thing here, as much as I really love these mini games, is that I was reminded that uh, of one discussion topic I wanted to bring up today, which is the actual length of the mini games. Uh, how long is too long? How long is too short? Even when all players are engaged, like in a cooperative game. Uh, and I'm trying to figure this out for my game because I I love when mini games and this is actually another thing I want to bring up with time stories. There are two 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 elements here that it does well. One is the length of time, and I think if it lasts too long, um, players can kind of check out and and they can just say, okay, just one player, just figure it out, just go ahead and do it, and I'll 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 wait. Um, so that's one aspect of it, and I think that's countered by the other aspect, which is theme. So in Mansions of Madness, where you have that like shape moving puzzle and even the icon matching puzzle, they don't feel very thematic, um, like especially the shape move, moving puzzle. It just doesn't it doesn't feel like I'm doing something that matches with uh, the theme of the game. And Mansions of Madness is a very thematic game. In Time Stories, especially in the latest episode, I, I don't remember all the ones. Actually, no, Time Stories does a pretty good job of this, as does another game that I'll mention in a second. It really does a great job of matching the theme of what you've encountered with the puzzle itself. And that really keeps my attention when that happens. So in mini games where I otherwise might check out if it's taking too long, in uh, Time Stories and the other example that I'll mention, because of the theme, it keeps me engaged. So I think that's really important to keep in mind, that, that the theme of the minigame matches uh, the, the mechanism, and the mechanisms match the theme, vice versa. Uh, I had another thought that I wanted to share there as I was talking about Time Stories. Um, oh, hello. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, I'll, I'll mention this in reference to um, a couple of these other games. So... Um, you have escape room games like Exit and Escape Room in a Box. These often have more puzzles than mini games, with the, the difference in my mind being that a puzzle can only be solved once. Once you solve the puzzle, it's not replayable. There's no variability in terms of the puzzle itself. And we encountered that a little bit in Time Stories, but there are different ways to, so to play the mini games. And so, uh, they are still puzzles in that there's like, once you play them and solve them, you probably wouldn't play them again uh, because there's no like re preset replayability. There's no randomization in them. And the same goes for these uh, escape room games. They're, they're puzzles that you play. So you take a break from the action of the game, you encounter this puzzle and you have to stop and play the puzzle, play the mini game 
and uh, before moving on. Um, and uh, so that's another different interesting category here that I'm trying to think about with my uh, the game that I'm designing. All the mini games that I'm designing are designed to be replayed so that if you encounter them in a future game, you can the, there are randomization elements that make them replayable. The tough thing there though with replayability and variation is that sometimes with mini games, you might make them randomly so difficult that they you may not be able to solve it. It may be impossible to solve the mini game. And I'm okay with that. Uh, I think I think that's okay in the in the right game, uh, as long as players still, ideally, I, if they still get something for trying, um, and if they still uh, if they improve in their skills, so like the next time they do it, they can get better at it, and if they learn more information about it in terms of like which type of character is better at uh, doing this mini game based on their inherent skill set. Uh, so those are all different conf- uh, considerations that I'm thinking about with my replayable mini games, but that is something to think about. Do you have a puzzle that you can just solve once, or do you have mini games that have randomization but have, but as a result you have less control over them as the designer? Uh, let's see what's next. Seventh Continent. So this is the one that I was alluding to a second ago. Seventh Continent has a bunch of different mini games. I have probably only encountered a few of them in my plays of them. Uh, one that specifically comes to mind is a uh, there's a mini game. This happens a number of times. This is a minor spoiler, but it's very very minor. Is that sometimes you'll get your foot caught in a trap, and you'll have this little puzzle, this gear puzzle, where you have to determine uh, which way you're going to turn the first gear so that all the other gears loosen the trap instead of tighten it. Um, and so you're you're kind of just looking at this gear and 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 figuring out which way to move it. The uh, so there's a pro and a con to this puzzle. One is that it can only be solved once, but because it appears multiple times in the game, uh, you you don't you can't really remember it. So, and there might even be different. I, I think the all the gear traps might be the same number of cards. So if you encounter a card three hundred gear trap, there might be several three hundred. So you might shuffle them. So actually, that's one way to get around the replayability. Have the same type of puzzle, but have multiples of it that you shuffle together. And uh, so that whenever you encounter it, you don't know which one it is, especially if they look very similar. Um, but the other element of this mini game, and I think, is a pro and a con, is that it's it's on a single card, and so it's kind of hard to to share it with other players. Usually one player will look at it and they'll just do it and they'll they'll say the answer. So that to me is kind of a con that only one player at a time can really look at it. But the pro is that whenever we play Time Stories, we always like to check each other's work because we only get one shot at, at that. Otherwise, we're going to lose our foot in this trap. And so I like that it inherently engages other players even though it's not simultaneous because I'll do it and then I'll hand it off to another player and say, hey, check my work. See what you got. I'm not going to tell you what I got yet. You can test it out and see if your answer is the same as mine. So I think there's a pro and a con to doing that. Um, and I'm not sure which I like more. I think I think maybe having a few of those in a game is great. And also having a few mini games that all players can look at with, and interact with at the same time is also really nice. That's uh, The Seventh Continent. I'm actually, as I'm talking about this, I'm, I'm mentally taking notes about uh, things that I want to use in my game. Because I, I, I didn't think about that idea of having multiple, having a puzzle where you have multiple puzzles that look very similar that you shuffle together so you don't know which puzzle you're getting even though you're in, you might enc- encounter the exact same puzzle that you had before. Um, and I also like that the other note I'm, I'm jotting down is I like the idea of getting something even if you fail. Um, that way you don't feel like you had a wasted turn necessarily. Oh, okay, so the final two examples I have here are kind of fun. They are, are not games that I've played, but... Uh, but they're video games, and I don't play many video games. But I have researched these because I'm fascinated by the idea of mini games that appear in video games that may not otherwise have uh, mini games. Uh, one example is Stardew Valley, which looks like a game that I actually would really enjoy playing, but I probably get sucked into it if I did play Stardew Valley. You're you're living in a village, you're building your farm, and uh, you're exploring this cave system. And I imagine there are a lot of mini games I don't even know about. I think the cave system itself is, is a mini game, but. Uh, there's a fishing mini game in it that I've looked into a little bit, and uh, uh, Seventh Continent also has a fishing mini game. But it, it's it, 
it's kind of, again, it's a break from the action. It's a break from the normal things that you're doing in Stardew Valley. You do this one little specific mini fishing mini game where you're trying to catch the fish at the right time. And sometimes you can even catch better items or different items or, or sometimes worse items like shoes uh, while you're while you're fishing in Stardew Valley. So I think that's cool. The other one that that I am just enamored with is called Gwent. It appears in The Witcher 3. So The Witcher 3 is a is an open world exploration game, one that I've, I've definitely been looking at for my uh, open world exploration game. But in the world of the game, the people, like the NPCs of the world and the main character, the character that you play in the game, The Witcher himself, uh, they play this very popular card game called Gwent. That it's a fictional card game that exists in this fictional world. Uh, that people just play. And so you can encounter someone in like a tavern and throw down your Gwent deck against their Gwent deck and play them, um, play a game of Gwent. I don't know you win if you if you win a game. Maybe it's money. Maybe you put an ante in the, in, within the game. But I love this idea of a kind of a Magic the Gathering style game within the greater world that many people are into and that you can play inside the game. And I also think it's just impressive that in addition to designing The Witcher 3, the designers also designed this card game that apparently is actually pretty fun. Uh, I haven't played it myself, but I think it even exists now outside of the world of the game. I think you can play Gwent if you want uh, elsewhere. But I love that idea of having not just a, a mini game or a puzzle, but a collectible trading mini game inside of a fictional world. That's just, that's amazingly met up and, and really, really cool. Um, and that's inspired something actually for my open world game that, uh, that, I, that I'm going to try. I'm, I'm not sure if it'll work, but I'm going to try it. I think I've hit all the different things. Talk about cooperative versus competitive, what the right length is, getting something even if you fail, having uh, having progress versus a hard stop, and the other topics that I've covered in today's discussion about mini games. But I'd love to hear your thoughts and examples. And it's okay if your defini definition of mini game or puzzle varies from mine. I'd still like to hear your examples in the comments. If you can think of other games that in that have mini games, I want to hear your thoughts about the mini games that I mentioned. Do you like? Uh, do you like that break from the action? Do you like it if it's very thematic? Do you not care if it's not thematic as long as you enjoy the puzzle? How do you do things like counter in a cooperative game in a, in a mini game? How do you counter um, alpha player syndrome, especially for a mini game where someone can just take over and do it? Um, what are the ways that you can counter that? Um, and any other thoughts you have, especially about video games, a world that I don't know a lot about. If you have any favorite mini games and video games that you think could translate well to a tabletop game, I'd love to hear about them in the comments as well. All right, thanks for joining me for this week's Sunday Sit Down. If you want to reference any of these games that I've mentioned, feel free to read the description below. And if you haven't subscribed, feel free to join us. I do these every week. I've done a variety of topics. You can look back at the older videos, but feel free to, to subscribe to this video if you want to see future um, Sunday Sit Downs in the future. All right, take, take care. Thanks.